he would like, that he, was, he wanted to know or talk about how we could maybe encourage the community to be more receptive to people and people to be feel more comfortable with their culture. And that's kind of what he asked me to talk about. Uh, that's why I can't remember what the title is. Um, but let me just put that in context why he asked me. And why, what I'm going to talk about, because he put lots of questions there. By the way, the guy that he was describing, I don't even know who he is. <laughs> he got some Bible from the internet. <laughs> He's got the wrong guy, by the way. Um, but that's something else. Okay. You know, we have two uh, brothers from, two guys from Denmark. Special son to Casper and Special Dean. And, uh, Unfortunately, I feel less scared because I met Nathan Daniel uh, on the steps here. Two of my, uh, yeah, I was wondering if they were. They're also from England. So. And um, yeah, I'm in a fuss. So if I speak too fast and I get any other problems, you have to just kind of slow down. She's interpreting the dialogue. And if Nate or Daniel, if I say anything in some foreign language other than Scottish, you know, just put your hand up and say, what the hell does that mean, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, what, what's the context of this talk and why, what's my background, my connection to this topic? The only time I've ever spoken about something directly like this was at a conference in, in Denmark, and that's why I mentioned my two Danish brothers, Casper and uh, Nasruddin, who's an honorary Dane from Singapore. You know in Denmark there were some riots last uh, couple of years time. And the community, when I say community, we're talking about the security, the police, the mosques, the media. A lot of people were looking at what went wrong. Why were kids, why were young people rioting? So they got all these people that they thought might know about rioting, um, including the imam of the New York Police Department. Um, all these kind of people from all over the world. And somehow this primary school teacher from Scotland was invited. And I ended up going and talking. So they all gave their interpretation of why, why these riots took place. And then it was my turn. And I thought, what should I say? Apart from, that if I was 16 and living in Denmark, in the area where the riots took place, is this being filmed by me? Because I'm going to get into trouble. <laughs> all right. Can maybe this bit just be cut out? If I was 16 and living in that part of Denmark, I probably would have rioted as well. And the guy from the New York Police Department, he took his badge out. <laughs> he's kind of really scared. I thought he was going to arrest me. But it's the truth. And I told them why. Why I, in that circumstance, probably would have ended up like that. Not because I'm condoning what happened. I'm not condoning rioting. And I'm not condoning burning cars. You know, it's wrong. But the reasons why are more important if you want to try and solve the problem. And what I've said, and I told the story of um, um, a young man that was born in Nottingham. We need a full Bible by that, Okay, just in case. Anyway, this guy, good job. This guy was born in Nottingham. He supported Nottingham Forest. Like, they are the best, well, at that time, they were the best team in the world. And I'm not biased, of course. Um, and this guy was a forest fan. He supported Nottingham Forest. He was absolutely mad about his football team. But whenever England played Scotland, he supported Scotland. Whenever England played cricket, he supported the other team. And if anyone ever asked him, 
Where are you from? He would never say England. But he wasn't from Bristol. So he just said, I'm from Nottingham. Why was that significant? It's because that person had an attachment to something, but it wasn't the concept, the culture of what made England English. He didn't feel English. But he still attached himself to a football team. And uh, let me say another person who was also from Nottingham. Um, got involved in, in things that maybe he wasn't proud of later in life. And he ended up, you know who Hell, what Hell's Angels are? You know Hell's Angels in Singapore? <laughs> They're guys that ride around on motorbikes and basically, this particular group, they used to ride around on motorbikes and beat people up and listen to heavy metal music and get drunk and fight. That was their lifestyle. And this guy, who isn't from a Muslim background, he grew up in England, he was born in England, grew up in England, then he joined the Hell's Angels. It's not kind of a really kosher kind of thing to do. But he became a Hell's Angel. And anyone knows about Hell's Angels, you can't become a Hell's Angel without going through what you call the initiation. So after a few months of being a, like a probationary Hell's Angel, you can join the pack by going through the initiation. And he passed his test and he became a full-blown member of this particular pack of the Hell's Angels. And the initiation ceremony is that he takes off his leather jacket, throws it on the floor, and everybody, if anyone's under 18, has to cut those your ears this is X-rated. And everyone around urinates on the jacket. And then he has to promise that he'll never wash the jacket. And this is like to prove that he's part of his pack. And then he can swear that he, with his life, that he will not allow anyone from his pack member to be harmed. And as they were urinating on his jacket, it came to his mind, my mum wouldn't be pleased with this. <laughs> Seriously, this is what came through his mind. My mum wouldn't be pleased with this. And he decided after getting initiated into the Hell's Angel group that he didn't want to be Hell's Angel anymore. <laughs> and he then went off to Tunisia to learn about Islam. So these two guys, why are they relevant to this story? It's because each one of them had an attachment to something. But it wasn't the norm. It wasn't what was, they were supposed to be attached to. And I was telling this story in front of all of these kind of policy makers, and politicians, and police people, and like security, and Islamic leaders, and I was telling them that a lot of the kids that I knew in that, those particular parts of Denmark where there were burning cars, they didn't feel Danish. They didn't feel Danish. If they were supporting a team, they would support the team that was playing against them. They didn't feel they belonged there. But they didn't also feel Muslim or Turkish. They didn't feel, their parents may have been Turkish, but they didn't feel Turkish. They didn't feel Arab. They didn't feel anything. And if you don't feel anything, you don't, nothing belongs to you and you belong to nothing. It's very easy to burn cars when you're angry. And when somebody really upsets you, like the police, I'm going to get into real trouble. Where are we going this? <laughs> if, and what had happened, there was some, instant, inst, some misunderstanding, but that would be politically correct. There was some misunderstandings between the police and these young people. And some fighting took place and they burned cars. Why did they burn cars? It's because they had no attachment to Denmark. These cars were the enemy. What people needed to do, these young people, you couldn't just say, be Danish. You couldn't say to them, be Turkish. They need to find out who they are. And until they find out who they are and feel where they belong, they will not respect property. They won't respect property because property doesn't, it doesn't mean anything because you don't know what property is. So that's the context of what I was talking about in Denmark. And I think Harley was hoping I was going to talk about the problems of the youth. In, in uh, Southeast Asia. 
Now, what's that, what relevance does my experience in Denmark and Nottingham, what's that got to do with here? Now, I'm here by accident, you know that. I wasn't planning to come to Singapore. Mm -hmm. I was in KL, Kuala Lumpur, and these guys came into my hotel, tattoos all down their arms, long hair. One of them, an Australian guy, Peter, nice tie, but you know, smart, young, like rebel looking. And at the front there was this kind of youth worker type person, and a few guys in their 40s. So I'm standing around in the lobby, and I walked in, and I just given a talk in one of the mosques. And I came and I thought, what's going on here? And this guy comes up and hugs me. I think, okay, nice. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, he being at the talk, I he attended the talk that I'd given some days before. So he recognized me, and I didn't recognize him. And he's like, you've got to meet some of my friends. You don't mind if they have tattoos. And I said, why should I? For your friends, whoever you are, that's fine. So I went up and I started chatting with all these guys who were, and they, they were artists. They were artists and musicians. And you could just tell one or two of them were into hip hop. So he started talking about, uh, I just said, I thought you were into hip hop. I'm like, yeah, you know hip hop? And I said, actually, no, I'm more into it. And I didn't say, I'm a physical recording, I don't want to. Anyway, and they were talking about how, and I said, you know, my experience in the Southeast Asia is my third trip. All the young people seem to be, and in Denmark, seem to be into hip hop. Whereas most of the older generation are into Iron Maiden. They're into Iron Maiden Guns N' Roses. It's true. And the guy says, how do you know so much about? Uh, Southeast Asia, I says, look, you know the young people that, you know, young people like yourself, I was saying, these guys with the tattoos and long hair, I said, you think that you're doing something, you know, you're not doing anything different to those the guys over there. The only difference between you and them is they hid their love for Iron Maiden. And I know that whenever I used to travel around, I don't know how you say Iron Maiden in sign language, sorry. <laughs> how about ACDC? You can spell it. <laughs> I'd be sitting and almost all of the Malaysians, I can say Malaysians, I'm going to Singapore, it's been very Singapore, it's been very Or I know that they're exactly the same. <laughs> okay. If they're in their 30s or 40s and you start talking about Iron Maiden or ACDC or any rock band, they all know exactly what you're talking about. To the extent that one guy who had he gave me a, a series, he wanted to give me some Qasidas. Like, you know, like these Arab songs and Islamic material. Oh, I've got some CDs, I'll put it up. The first one, nice, tell her, I do I laid a beautiful Arabic song. Next one, Guns N' Roses. <laughs> <laughs> Oops! <laughs> and it's, it's typical. And it's not just teenagers that have an identity, so to speak, crisis. The difference between the identity crisis and all of my friends, new, newly acquainted friends in their 20s and teens, was that they went to hip hop and the other guys were into rock. And then this 40 year old guy came up and he says, you know, we just had an argument in the car about who played this song. Was it Deep Purple or, or Led Zeppelin? Would you mind, Sheikh, would you mind listening to this and tell me who it was? And it was King Crimson. So I told him, I was fine, mate, you're both wrong. It was King Crimson. Says, wow. And then we started, to, we spoke for like two hours. And these like really standard looking, like older gentlemen, not older gentlemen, like mature <laughs> Malaysian um, elders, so to speak. And it just showed that people are people. And what's the time again? I've got to talk about time. <laughs> Come as you are. That's how they have some connection to the title. <laughs> Come as you are. You know those guys, all of them, I had a really nice time in the lobby of my hotel. Those people were really honest, sincere, good people. And we talked about a lot of things, about music, about politics, <coughs> about culture, about religion, and we were comfortable with each other. There was no pretense. And what the topic of today is come as you are. 
Because unfortunately, the problem with the Muslim community, we're going to get into real trouble. You really make it. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to go for it. The problem with the Muslim community is that they don't know what that means. They don't know how people should just come as they are. And people don't know what it means to come as you are. They think you can't come as you are. You have to pretend to be someone else. And what happens is that people are not honest with themselves. They're not honest with their religion. And as a result, people get isolated from the reality of their religion. And because they become isolated from their religion, they have identity crises. And they end up with tattoos all down their arm. And they don't know where, I'm not saying this, not give, I'm not a scholar, so I'm not giving you the fifth. If you want the fifth tattoo, we'll talk about it in questions and answers. So that's not what the point is here. Is that in Islam, there is a precedent of how people should behave as a community. And these people are part of our community. The guys that were burning cars are part of the community. The guys with tattoos down their arm would probably not be able to come into this mosque. They need to wear one of those blue things, okay? In the mosque, just because he's went to the mosque now. In fact, maybe he was told to put, his, his, put one of those things on because his pants are too short. Okay, so, and I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that how was the real mosque, the first mosque? Because we like to talk, I'm going to get into so much trouble. <laughs> we like to talk about being Ahlis Sunnah, the people of the right path. And we talk about Ahl Sunnah as if to be a Sunni, to be someone that follows Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, your beard needs to be a particular length. And your trousers need to be a particular length. And to show how Sunni you are, how Muslim you are, you can do it by measuring the length of the beard and the length of the trousers. I don't know if it's like that in, 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 in Singapore, but it is like that in some parts of Europe and certainly in the Middle East. And I'm telling you, that's not how it was in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu What's the second part of the talk? Well, there's two parts. I can't remember. One was covers you on the other bit was about knocking on the door. All right, knocking on the door of God. The first poem that the young man sang was, Ya Imam al-Rusli, O leader of the prophets, meaning Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Anta Allah, you, on the door of God. Wasn't that one of you guys? That's what you sang, wasn't it? Answer about the law. Which is a nice introduction because that's what the title is about. How did the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet Muhammad, accept people in the mosque? That's the question. How do you knock on the door? If he's the door, how did he behave? What was he like? One of the saddest things that I heard since I've been in Singapore was about a mosque which I won't mention. But they have blue jackets at the front um, in case people have to take short, their arms are too short, their the shirt is too short. And a, a, a Brazilian lady came to visit this very beautiful mosque with a golden crown. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and And they say, you can't come in. There's only three minutes till the prayer. You have to go. And she says, please. OK, two minutes. <laughs> and put this on. So she puts on the blue now. She walks for two minutes near the box. She takes it off and she says, I'm not religious.
That's what I would have used the title. Because that's what was happening. How was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Is that mosque behaving in the way of the Prophet? And I'd say, I say no. And I have my reasons. The first one. What would happen if I went into this mosque? And I peed, urinated all over the mosque. What would the imam say? I mean, he just, they just threw the Brazilian girl out. She just came in there knocking on God's door. She came in because she smelled the shisha and the couscous and the Turkish kebab and she saw the golden dome and she heard the adhan. She came with a good intention. And in the time of the Prophet wasallam, the child of Muhammad wasallam, a man walked into the mosque and he urinated in front of the Prophet. And somebody got up to stop him. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Dab, leave him, let him finish. Let him finish. Why? Because if you stop somebody <coughs> midstream, you could cause health problems. <laughs> and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came. We hear in these Mawid gatherings, what was he sent as? Rahmatan lil alameen, a mercy to all of the worlds. So if somebody happened to be urinating in the mosque, it wouldn't be very merciful to stop him mid-flow. So he didn't. He said this. And then he sat down, I assume a little bit away from the puddle. <laughs> and he sat with the Prophet for one hour, according to, uh, in Arabic they say sa'ah, which could not mean, doesn't mean 60 minutes, but he sat for a while. And then he got up and he said, okay, in this religion of yours, do I have to pray? And the Prophet says, comes to my wife and says, no. That's five times a day. He said, good. Any more? <laughs> Only if you want to. Five is enough, but if you want to, do you more? Okay. And what about this charity stuff? Do I have to do that too? He says, yes, a little bit every year. Two and a half percent. If you have a lot of money, two and a half percent. You don't have any money, you don't have to give. Okay. What about fasting? He wasn't very polite. And if you read it in Arabic, that's the kind of tone. What about fasting? He says, yes, in the month of Ramadan. And he said, do I have to do any more? He says, well, we have to go, huh? Except if you want to do more. If you want to, we can. And he says, what about this pilgrimage thing? Going to Mecca. He says, yes, once in your life. Any more than that? So, give you a hundred dollars. Excuse me, you want to? One lie! La azidu ala hada wa la antus. I had to put the Germans. He said, by God, I will not do any more or any less than you told me to do. And he left. The guy comes in, he pees on the floor. He talks to the Prophet like that. And what does Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa do? He turns to some of the companions when he says, Qad aflah sallallahu That man's going to heaven. If he's telling the truth, that man's going to heaven. And then he told Umar ibn al-Khattab, clean up the mess of this. <laughs> and what did Umar ibn al-Khattab do? That day, he cleaned it up. When you're talking about knocking on the door, you will not chase anybody away. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa have you ever seen anybody more rude than that coming into any mosque, anywhere? How did Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa behave? That's the first thing. Okay, let me talk about maybe, that's a bit extreme. Yeah? And, and, and you know, maybe we can't be that. What about a case where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is sitting alone in the mosque? He's on his own in the mosque, praying, doing the worship and things. Alone, nobody's in the mosque. And a man walks in, and he sits down on his own a little bit over there. What would the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? Any suggestions what he might do? You've got a suggestion, what do you think? Anybody? Exactly. He got up and he sat next to the person. 
said, the mosque is big, you don't have to sit with me. <laughs> he said, the magic word said, the mosque is big, you don't have to sit next to me. What did Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? He said, he could be mu'min in haq. Every believer has a right. Every believer has a right. He didn't go any further, he didn't say any more. What he implied by that is that people have rights over each other, duties towards each other. And the least duty is shown by this is to get up and show some warmth to somebody who is a total stranger. That's the least you should do. So when we talk about what was he like in the mosque, it's, it's interesting how he behaved. I mean, I can, I get a, a lot of people come to me, some of them thrown out of the mosque. And a lot of people sent by the mosque, they'll say, you've got a problem, don't come here, go speak about the lizards. And they come to me and they talk to me about all kinds of things, really, um, you know, almost total strangers. There's one lady, she'd gone to the mosque, got an opinion from the mosque, and they said, if you want a second opinion, there's a guy called Abdul Aziz. Go and find him. So she found out where I lived, which area. She stood on the corner on my street, waiting, because she knew I lived roughly around there. She waited on my street corner till she saw me driving in. Then she followed the car and went knocking on the door. Does Sheikh Abdul Aziz live here? My wife looked at her. I could see my wife's eyes. She was going to kill her. <laughs> This, she's not knocking on the door. She's not coming to the mosque, she's coming to my, and my wife has a right here. So I'm not saying my wife's out of order. Because um, strange women shouldn't come following her husband's home. She has rights too. And unfortunately, too many strange women follow her husband's home. Because of this. You just cut the first 20 minutes out. Alright, shall we? Alright, so. She had some really deep personal issues she needed to talk about. And that's why she followed him home. And alhamdulillah, her problems were solved. But why couldn't the Imam have solved them? Why did she have to come out of the mosque? Is there anything that the Imam can't deal with? Is there anything that Imam shouldn't be able to deal with? If somebody comes to me, and this has happened, Somebody comes to me, they're good people. I know these two people are good people. You can just look in their face and say, these are good people. And he says, look, I'm in a mess. I've got a girlfriend. She lost her, she got thrown out of her house. She had nowhere to live. So she came to live in my flat. And we're doing things that we're not supposed to be doing. You know, we're, we're living like we shouldn't. What can we do? Can we go to the mosque and get advice about this? Can he walk into the mosque and say, oh, by the way, I've committed adultery. Have you got any advice for me? Should he be able to do that? Should he be able to knock on the box door and say, by the way, I'm thinking of committing adultery. Got any advice for me? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa how would he have dealt with it? Because it happened. It did happen. The man came into the mosque and he says, you know, I like your religion stuff. I like Islam, but I want to commit adultery. Can you just, I don't, I, can you just give me a little bit of permission for this? Can you just give me permission to do adultery? Please? Can you give me permission to do adultery? Because obviously, if Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says something is halal, it's halal. So he wants him to say, yes, it's, it's okay. Just don't do too much. That's what they were expecting. He was, he was hoping for some kind of answer. What would the email have said? The lady who came, the Brazilian lady, she was thrown out of the box just for having short arms, short sleeves. She didn't come in and ask her, I'm going to make an ultra. So, I'm sorry, but if I meant, if I sound like I'm picking on a particular mosque, I'm not, I don't mean it. I'm talking generally about our community and just happened that this story was told to me, it upset me. 
on the way to the mosque. So if I sound like I'm picking on this mosque, please forgive me. Okay, they, this man came into the, into the mosque and did this, said this. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sit down, please. Sit down. He says, how would you like it if I gave somebody permission to commit adultery with your mother? No, that's not good. He says, what if I gave permission to, to, your, to your daughter? No! What if I gave somebody permission to commit adultery with your sister? What about your aunt? What about your niece? And he just listed like all the things. No! 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 And you can see him getting more and more upset. And then Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa put his hands on his chest like this and he said, Is that your little friend? Just how do you feel? He said, You know, when I came into this mosque, I was so desperate to commit adultery. It was the only thing on my mind. And now, it is the most ugly, evil thing on the earth. When you deal with people, when the Prophet when Muhammad dealt with people, he didn't chase people away. These are extreme cases, which we should be able to deal with in us. A little tattoo, is not the same as somebody urinating in the mosque. A little hair showing is not the same as somebody urinating in the mosque. So when we kind of come as you are, I'm not saying you should come and urinate in the mosque. But you should, anyway, we'll come to what I, what I think in a minute. But <coughs> Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was somebody who smiled a lot. Somebody asked me, in the introduction, they said, um, the brother said, how come he studied under? Shaykh Abdul Aziz Frederick is from Scotland, has traveled to various parts of the world seeking knowledge. His teachers include Al Habib, Ahmed, Mashhur, bin Taha, bin Ali, Al Haddad. <laughs> Like one of the biggest, biggest scholars of his time. And it's true. I studied under him. And somebody came and says, what did you learn from Al-Habib Ahmed? Tell me about Al-Habib Ahmed. I thought, the first thing that came to my mind is, he had a really nice smile. And somebody asked me, tell me about Al-Habib Ahmed. The first thing that came to my mind was, he had a nice smile. And he says, what did you learn? And I'm trying to think, well, what did I learn? <laughs> you know, I wasn't a good student. <laughs> you, know, you, you know those naughty boys at the back of the class? Huh? Well, Habib Ahmed loved the naughty boy at the back of the class more than the other kids. <laughs> now, he's some guy from Nottingham. <laughs> right? And he used to support Nottingham Forest. But he was, and the Habib Ahmed, he loved him. He wasn't a good student. And when the student was asked, so what did he learn? He said, I learned it's important to smile. And to be honest, the most important thing that I learned from my teacher, Habib Ahmed, was that if you don't smile, in fact, I just don't know what happened. I just only know him, he smiled all the time. Whatever happened, he was smiling. And whoever came into his house, he was smiling. And that's how I thought the Prophet ﷺ was. When he saw people, he didn't think, why are you urinating in my mosque? He just smiled. And I could imagine, and I know something similar happened to Habib Ahmed the short of that, the person who was a teacher. And I know he just smiled. And for me, that's the most important thing. It's important <coughs> to smile and to be Show your warmth and from your heart. I'm not just saying from your heart. You need to love people. And if you love people, it will come out. And if you love people, you'll be able to welcome them into your heart, into your mosque, into your home. And you won't look. He's got a tattoo, you know that. Or, do you know this that lady's got a hair show? You know, they, they, they won't. If you have warmth, your heart will open up. And you will deal with people according to their situation. Now, when I go 
to a lot of mosques. I'm really scared. I look at the imams and they scare me. Maybe I'm just scared easily. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe Singaporean imams are different. Maybe I'm not having Hassan or he smiles all the time. <laughs> That's why I like that mosque, is because their imams smile all the time. It's Alhamdulillah. I like that mosque. Why? Not because it's the best mosque. I don't know. It's the best. But he smiles. I like him. But I like that mosque. But a lot of us, they don't smile. Growl. <laughs> and they've got this look of anger. And you think, have they ever, ever heard a joke? <laughs> Never mind told a joke. Have they ever heard a joke? Ever. And then I thought about it. What about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Did he ever tell jokes? That's an interesting thought that came to my mind. And I thought, let me he introduce me to Sheikh, so I'm going to pretend. Right? Because I'm just trying to make it. I don't want him to look as if he's alive. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to get a book that's in Arabic. And I'm going to read it in one or two words in Arabic just to show him that he's not alive. All right? Um, I'd recommend Hussein ibn Zayd. Qala kultu li Jafar ibn Muhammad. Ja'altu fadaka hal kan. هل كانت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مداحبة ومداحبة مداحبة He said this man Hussein bin Zayd came to Ja'far ibn Muhammad and he said did the Prophet ever tell jokes? Or did he ever clown around? I don't know if that translation but it should mean did he joke and did he laugh at his people? Did he make did he make them happy make them laugh by teasing them joking? He says, he has been described as having the most amazing character. That's how the Quran describes him. This is a verse of Quran, and surely you are, you have a tremendous character. But people don't know what that means. So they said, did he joke? And the answer was, he had a great character. She said, yes or no? They don't know. You can't think it. How good is a look at me? I hope he's not going to ask me that later. Unless it's about my name. That's what the guy is going to do. I don't know if he's lined up with my name. The answer was, and he went on, he says, some of the prophets were sent. Huh? Kazada. I don't speak to your own. What is the castle? He's like an Arabic scholar. Gazaza means like in difficult times they were kind of heavy. He says some of the prophets were sent and they were kind of heavy. Well, what are you referring to? The prophet Moses. For example, Musa is known to be one of the stern, to be stern in his demeanor. And he, he, was, he was a stern person. And so Jaffar ibn Muhammad is saying some of the prophets were sent as stern people. وبعد محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم في الرحمة في الرحمة والرحمة he was sent with mercy and gentleness وكان من رحمة الأمة and he was gentle with all of his nation and what's meant by his nation in this sentence and in many other sentences it doesn't just mean the Muslims because there's two meanings of the Ummah of Muhammad the nation of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم one of the meanings is is all of the people that came from the time of his birth till the time of his prophecy till the end of time, whether they believe in him or not. And then there's a special meaning of it, is those that believe in him. So here, he says he came to all of his nation, whether they're Brazilian or not, as a mercy and gentle to them. And he said, and he did used to joke with them, and he said, but he never, he never, um, he never said anything wrong, and he said, and then he said, then Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says, about joking, he says, Inna Allah yabhal mu'abbas fi wujuhi tu ikhwani. He says, Allah, God, is angry with the person who has a, a stern look on their face when they meet their brothers. And I think about it. And I think, 
child with the beard who thinks it's Sunna growling. <laughs> <laughs> this makes him more Islamic. <laughs> Somehow they find me. <laughs> they, I remember this story. A lady came into the to the Prime Minister's office. He's sitting with a companion in the kitchen. And this lady comes in. She's really upset, really angry. And she barges in. And she said, "I want to talk about my husband. My husband is this, and my husband, and my husband." And she was really. She's really angry. <laughs> she's like, she's going on and on. And Tom is all alone and he's smiling. She says, this, this stuff. Your husband, is he the one that's got white around his eyeballs? She says, what's wrong with my husband's eyes? <laughs> yeah, he's, I think I know your husband. He's got white around his eyeballs, hasn't he? What's wrong with my husband's eyes? <laughs> what, what, what are you saying about my husband's eyes? Is it, he, he's got white, he's got like an eyeball, and then around the eyeball, it's white, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is laughing. I get her, except Prophet Salah was just like smiling at me. And then she was like, everybody has white around their eyeballs. <laughs> and then she laughs. And then, as soon as she laughs, he says, okay, now tell me about your husband. Well, this is what happened. Now she's completely changed. Now this is really important. This story is really, really, it's not just a joke. It teaches us about how you deal with people. You need, you just, joking is not just, joking is the sunnah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the prophet Muhammad joked. He teased us, but he had a purpose behind it. And there's a lesson in this. And anyone that has strange women walking, following the home from the mosque, <laughs> better be careful because your, your wife is going to get really angry with you. Unless you have a very patient wife like mine. Alhamdulillah, she's been to all sorts of things. And women camping in my garden. Alhamdulillah, that's another story. <laughs> and what, this lady comes in my house, she's really upset. What does she need? She doesn't need somebody with a big beard. I'm not saying big beards are wrong, by the way. I'm just saying that she needs somebody to talk to. She needs somebody who can listen. And she needs somebody who can understand her situation. But they didn't, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa didn't talk about her situation. He distracted her from her situation by talking about something which made her feel relaxed. Made her feel relaxed. And I learned a lot from that. And from Habib Ahmed Bashar, who used to smile all the time. And whenever anybody came into the mocking his house, he welcomed them. Mahaba Bikum! And he made them tea. And he talked to them. And he used to talk about all kinds of stuff. And I learned a lot from that. And I'll give you an example. Because that's kind of what it was like in the past. But I'm going to come back to Can you remind me that I must, I must tell you an example? In like two minutes? All right. Actually, give me three minutes because I'm going to get. You probably notice I get distracted easily. And there's another really nice story I want to tell you about because this question's come up about jihad. You know, did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ever do jihad? Or did he just smile all the time? And that's not this, is it? <laughs> but I know somebody's thinking that. They're thinking, this guy's. He's trying to tell us that the Prophet used to joke all the time and was really nice and people used to pee in the mosque. And 